Um, good afternoon and welcome um, all of you. Thank you so much for, for joining us today for this event on uh, India-Pakistan relations. Um, and special welcome to those of you who are tuning in online to our webcast. Uh, my name is Moid Youssef. I work on uh, Pakistan issues at the Institute. Uh, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and introduce our program uh, before I, I hand it over to um, our Executive Vice President to introduce uh, Congressman uh, McDermott. Um, USIP's Pakistan program um, is multifaceted and it extends beyond uh, research-based analysis, which we do regularly. Uh, but we have got a lot of programmatic activities, which is part of our uh, mandate at USIP. Um, our research feeds directly into uh, our uh, projects on the ground in Pakistan. Um, and we, uh, for instance, one of our projects at this point, uh, we conduct trainings of conflict management uh, facilitators, people who go out in communities uh, and uh, take on dispute resolution. Uh, across Pakistan. Um, we've been doing this since 2009 and have been seeing uh, positive results come out of that. Uh, we are also uh, facilitating and uh, promoting dialogues between communities, fractured communities in conflict-ridden zones in Pakistan, as well as high-level policy uh, track two dialogues uh, between Pakistan and India. There are at least two that we are um, uh, supporting at, at this point. Uh, we're also involved in projects which uh, aim to counter extremist narratives and uh, in peace education activities. Uh, we've had recently a rather unique achievement. Uh, we produced a textbook on peace education, which is now being taken up uh, by the Islamic seminaries, the madrasas in Pakistan. And the textbook has been written by scholars from across various sects um, in Pakistan. So that's one of the examples of our actual programmatic work um, where, where the Madaris are now actually using some of the textbooks uh, that we've produced. Um, we're also getting involved in uh, media to, to inject uh, content on peace building and counter extremism um, in Pakistan. We've got a fairly large grants program which supports civil society organizations uh, who are working in, in areas which are priorities for USIP. Um, and so we've, we've got a fairly holistic presence, uh, both in terms of research and seminars, which of course most of you, uh, I'm sure, keep on attending and also get, um, get information for in your inbox, but also the other side of our work, which is uh, based in Pakistan itself. Today's event, I think, is a classic example of USIP using a problem-solving lens uh, when looking at issues of conflict, um, major conflict around the world. Uh, we try and address the how-to rather than what has happened in the past questions, as you'll see from our panelists uh, today. Uh, also, I think this is an example of USIP uh, developing synergies and bringing back uh, people who are part of uh, policy and programmatic work between Pakistan and India. Uh, two of our panelists, um, Ambassador Lalit Man Singh and Ambassador Shamshad Ahmed, uh, both former foreign secretaries from India and Pakistan respectively, are part of something called the Ottawa Dialogue, which is a senior level track two process that USIP is supporting uh, between the two countries. And uh, we just had a very productive meeting last week um, of, of that uh, process. This particular event, of course, uh, focuses on a critical issue, uh, the Pakistan-India conflict, which has been uh, there for the, the past 63 years. And while uh, we've focused much on Afghanistan in the past decade in this town, I think there's hardly anybody who believes that US interests in South Asia can be achieved uh, or stability can come to the region unless Pakistan and India are able to normalize uh, their relationship. And thus, thus I'm pleased that we are here uh, focusing on this issue and have an eminent um, list of speakers who are going to be speaking to us uh, today. Uh, not only experts in the subject, but also practitioners who spent a lifetime uh, dealing with this issue. Um, very quickly, just let me run through the sequence of what follows. Um, we'll have an introductory keynote um, uh, by Congressman Jim McDermott, uh, who will be introduced shortly. After that, our first panel focuses on the key challenges uh, between Pakistan and India, uh, the obstacles uh, as they move forward, looking at issues like terrorism, Kashmir, um, Afghanistan, uh, and then a panel on opportunities, which we term the underrepresented or underexplored dimension, the economic cooperation between the two sides. 
Um, and what better day to, to talk about this than when a Pakistani official today has reportedly uh, stated at a SARC meeting that Pakistan has agreed to provide India uh, the most favored nation status, which is one of the biggest obstacles in, in the economic uh, uh, cooperation. So without further ado, I want to pass it on to our Executive Vice President, Tara Sonnenschein, to introduce the Congressman. Thank you, Moeed, and um, thank you also to Ambassador Bill Taylor, who oversees all of the conflict management work here, and to all of you for your continued interest in our work, and particularly as it relates to India-Pakistan. I have the great privilege today of introducing a man who is not only a serious, serious congressional leader, but a serious foreign policy buff which is a great combination from where we are. Um, Congressman McDermott is serving his 12th term in the U.S. House of Representatives. As a senior member of the Ways and Means Committee, he is the ranking member of the Trade Subcommittee, also on the Human Resources Subcommittee and the Oversight Subcommittee. So he is a busy man and getting his time today as a keynote uh, was not easy, but we are delighted he could do this. In terms of foreign policy, Congressman McDermott's interest traces back to the late 1960s, where he served in the United States Navy as a psychiatrist. And I think in Washington right now, having a psychiatrist might be a very good thing. Um, after 15 years of serving in the Washington State Legislature, uh, Congressman McDermott left politics to serve as a Foreign Service Medical Officer in Congo, where he provided psychiatric services to members of the Foreign Service, USAID, and Peace Corps personnel throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. So his unique experience in developing countries has informed his views on the critical role the United States government can play in helping countries lift themselves out of poverty, build global coalitions, and address global challenges. Congressman McDermott has traveled widely, as all of you know, throughout South Asia, having visited every state in India and traveled to Pakistan on several occasions. He is one of the founders of the Congressional Caucus on India and Indian Americans, which also remain one of the largest country caucuses in the House of Representatives. So I ask for you to join me in a very, very warm welcome for Congressman Jim McDermott. Thank you very much. I uh, will start by using a mechanism they used at the United Nations. All protocols having been observed, uh, we welcome all of you here, uh, rather than going down the row here <laughs> with all the folks who are here. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be invited to speak here on something uh, related to normalization of India and Pakistan relations. Um, I was sitting, it just came to me while I was sitting here. Um, I've actually been on a trip with David Bonnier uh, one day, we were sitting on the floor of the house, and he said, I know about Pakistan, you know about India. Why don't we go over there and see if we can figure out how to fix Kashmir? Well, <laughs> sometimes children's crusades don't uh, work out perfectly, but uh, I've been involved in looking at these issues for a very long time. I am not quite uh, correct in my introduction. Uh, I was, I've only been in those states that the Indian government will let me go to. Uh, I have not been to Nagaland and Assam and some of the places up in the Northeast which are a little more conflictual than I remember uh, <clears throat> Siddhartha Ray was the ambassador some years ago and I said to him, can I go to Kashmir? He said, of course you can. I was governor there and I'm sure nothing will happen to you. So I went and uh, I was surrounded by soldiers. So I, I've been in these places and seen uh, what people are struggling with. And I want to congratulate Tara Sonnenschein for, and the rest of the Institute for this wonderful new facility. First time I've been in it. I came a little early today so I could 
walk around and kind of get a feeling for it because I've looked at it from the outside and it is wonderful to finally have a U.S. government institution with the word peace in its name. Uh, a permanent institution built to resolve and to manage conflict is long overdue and very welcome. <clears throat> now that I feel a little uh, uneasy being the keynote address. I feel like sort of like the appetizer because you're going to get the meat and potatoes from the next two panels. You've got to have some really good, uh, very knowledgeable people to talk about these issues. But let me give you some of my own thoughts about it. The first panel on challenges to normalization hits a central point. India and Pakistan have very serious issues to resolve water, energy, managing their borders, Kashmir, terrorism, uh, just to name a few. <clears throat> How these countries manage these in the 21st century, in my view, is going to be central to what happens in the world. If you come to my office, you'll find India's right there on the wall, and Pakistan, and Turkmenistan, and the stands, and Burma, and all the rest, and all the way to Iran. That part of the world, in my view, is where the focus of an awful lot of what happens in the next 100 years is going to be and how it resolves between Pakistan and India is really kind of central to that. Now, when I think about conflict <clears throat> and confrontation, it seems to me from a psychiatric point, it comes, becomes almost habitual sometimes, the kind of relationship we have with one another. Generals are often fighting the last war, and some of the biggest problem is to get people to really think, as you're trying to do today, <clears throat> about where we can go from here. Uh, part of the challenge on both sides is that hardliners on both sides have dug in after looking at three wars and a very troubled history. And for generations, and quite frankly, it can be hard to turn from any position that you've defended for so long. When you get sort of ground in, it's really hard to get people to come up out of the ruts and start talking about another way to think. Now, the first step, it seems to me, always has to be talking. And I think the Pakistanis and the Indians deserve a lot of credit for doing that. They've pushed through cycles of engagement, crisis, and re-engagement, often over loud protests from the folks back home. Uh, <clears throat> and I can't emphasize how important it is to keep people at the table. I don't think you can resolve anything by setting preconditions and saying, well, I don't, we're not, uh, we don't get those, why we're not coming to the table. You come to the table, everything's on the table, it has to be there. And I think that's the only way. I remember a story uh, <clears throat> about President Eisenhower, who probably put it best uh, about his frustrations of talking with Nikita Khrushchev. He said, <clears throat> quote, the basis of mistrust was not suspicion of Mr. Khrushchev. It was a problem of national psychology and popular feeling. And he went on to talk about the fact that every time he talked to Khrushchev, he was really talking to the people behind him. And when Khrushchev talked to him, he was talking to the people behind him. So that although they could have resolved things themselves, it was very hard in a political atmosphere to actually have an open conversation in which you talk about the problems and what are the reasonable ways out of it. Now, <clears throat> some of you may know I have many Indian friends and many Pakistani friends dating back to the 91, as you heard, when I founded the caucus on India. I went there originally to look at the AIDS epidemic because I'd just come from Africa. I'd spent, I'd been in every country south of the equator, 26 embassies, and seen the epidemic and what was happening. And I said when I, to the speaker when I got there, you're going to have a real problem in the world because of this epidemic. And he gave me really essentially a free pass to go. And the first country I went to was Thailand and then to India uh, in 91. And it struck me when I got there, there were no Americans, there were no American businesses. And I talked to the ambassador, and he said, you know, you should go home and start an India caucus because things are changing here. This is right after the wall fell, and the Indians were disengaging themselves from the uh, Soviets, and the Pakistanis were our good, close buddies, and it was a very uh, tumultuous time. And uh, so it was a very interesting time to come in and see, and I now have watched India go from 1990 to 2011, and the changes there are remarkable.
What Mohan Mohan Singh did as the finance minister and now I think he will go down in history as being one of the most important Indian politicians that ever was in the country. And I, I think the things he's been able to do have been really remarkable. Now, the dialogue between the countries has gone on and it's had its fits and starts and, and certainly uh, our, um, um, Vajpayee was, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee was one. There were many who've been back and forth in this thing trying to get it going. And the foreign secretaries, uh, Salman Bashir and, and uh, uh, Mr. Rao, deserve a lot of credit for their tenacity today in continuing the dialogue and looking for ways to Im implement confidence building contacts between the countries. And while Secretary Rao has now been tapped to become the U.S. Ambassador, uh, to the United States, I hope that these talks will continue on a regular basis uninterrupted. I hope that that the Indian government continues right on with this whole uh, connection to, uh, to dealing with uh, Pakistan. Because only through dialogue can we hope for resolutions to resolve the relatively modest issues, if you want to call them that, the Session Glacier issue, uh, dubbed the world's highest battlefield, uh, where most of the soldiers died from the weather than from the war. I mean, it was th those kinds of things we ought to be able to resolve by talking to one another. Um, last year, I had an en engineer, uh, the American Academy of Mechanical Engineers, as fellows. And they gave a fellowship to a 78-year-old man who showed up in my office and said, could I be your fellow? And I said, sure, come on in. I always can learn from somebody, and I'll send you out to do stuff. He said, what do you want me to study? And I said, water. And he said, fine. I've done water projects all over the world. And uh, in my state of Washington uh, and the American West, uh, we argue over a lot of stuff. But when you want to get down to a real argument, let's talk about water rights. And it is increasingly, in my view, uh, the issue that is going to overwhelm the world and certainly what's happening in the Himalayas is going to become an issue of major proportions uh, in Indian-Pakistan relations. Now, <clears throat> the Indus Waters Treaty uh, is an amazing accomplishment. It really has gone on for a very long time, uh, 50 years, three wars, uh, but generally it's worked out between the two countries. It has been a mechanism that has worked pretty well. Uh, but since I had some questions and I had just discovered this Indus Treaty, I never knew it existed until I started in looking at this, I thought, well, I'll get the Indians to come in and tell me how they think it's working, and I'll get the Pakistanis to come in and tell me how it's working. Uh, my staff made some calls, and I realized uh, I had stepped into something I didn't really realize. Uh, <clears throat> we got some answers, and we got some very angry responses from some people who said, look, we've been handling it ourselves. We don't need you Americans sticking your congressional nose into our problems or our, our processes. And <clears throat> we were um, a little bit worried that we'd stepped into something more than we could handle. But in the end, it worked out. But those issues are going to require people talking continually. You can see already the Chinese are trying to siphon off some water from the Bamaputra and irrigate land up in China, and you got you got things going on. And this is going to be an issue that I think we're, there will be, um, there needs to be some real talk about what happens. Now, over the years, I've talked to Indian and Pakistani diplomats about the cost of conflict, the time, the energy, and the resources spent on being at odds with one another, and got universal agreement that the opportunity cost is overwhelming. That's what got David and I to going over there, was thinking, gee, if we could just get these people to quit fighting each other, they could have more money to develop their countries. And <clears throat> uh, we could see that if they were putting their energies into political and uh, solutions rather than to military solutions and spent money, quit spending money on weapons and spend it more on, on development, they would be much better off in the long run. And besides which, you two nuclear powers sitting next to each other cannot be seriously thinking about using those weapons if there's any rationality left in the world because uh, the drifting of clouds and all of what can happen simply makes it, in my view, 
that that ought to be there ought to be a way to negotiate that kind of thing to uh, a standstill. Now, for all of this to happen, India needs a stable partner, Pakistan, and. I think that uh, as we look at Pakistan, it's been a very up and down situation over the course of the last number of years. Uh, and <clears throat> to, to um, have this relationship and this dialogue work, India has to continue to deal with their problems. One of the things I keep pointing out to people about the United States is that a democracy is an evolutionary process that never stops. If you look at the United States in 1789 and look at us today, well, you'd say, well, you know, why aren't these other countries going that route? Well, they're getting there in their own way. I mean, we started with slaves, women to have votes for 130 years. I mean, we, and the Indians started with women having vote from the start, and they had a women prime minister like that. So the issue of how a democracy moves forward, uh, I think, is one of those issues that that um, really we have to be tolerant of the way other people are getting to where they're going. We can encourage them, but we can't tell them this is the way it's got to be because God knows ours has our own problems. Uh, when you think, I, I, I still carry a 10,000 rupee note or a thousand rupee note in my pocket with the 17 official languages because I show it to people every time they tell me we got problems in the United States. I say, well, look at this. These people make a go of it with 17 official languages and six major religions. And, and the religious issues, as you can see, are, are ones that we are going to have. Now, I think in our relationship with, with Pakistan, we the Americans, need to stop sending mixed signals about our commitment toward peace, especially with Pakistan, uh, with whom we have managed our bilateral relations pretty badly. We were very close to them at one point, and then we sort of moved away from them, and then, and now we've got all this stuff going on around Afghanistan. I really think the term AFPAC ought to be dropped from our lingo um, because it perpetuates the perception that the only thing the United States is caring about is terrorism, counterterrorism, that that's where all the terrorism is, is over there because of that AFPAC thing. Well. For us to use that kind of a term really doesn't, isn't helpful, in my view, of, of working things out. And we really have to help the civilian government of Pakistan be stable and, and begin the development. And I think that that is one of the issues that I hope your, your panel will talk a little bit about. Now, the second panel uh, will take on the topic of how to normalize and the unrealized value of economic cooperation in the mix. How do you, how do, you do this? Uh, years ago, I started, uh, when I came back from Africa, to the Congress with Sub-Saharan Africa. It struck me that there was no trade policy for Africa. So I said, why not? We've got 800 million people over here with nothing. We've got all this with Asia, and we got all this stuff with... My staff says, shut up. Get out of here. Okay. <laughs> They're voting here in a little bit, but let me just, uh, the, 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 we started out with the ambassadors talking. We got all 25 ambassadors of Africa to come to my office and sit down and talk about trade. And <clears throat> it, it was not easy, uh, and it was hard to get something through the Congress, and it finally took the president going to Africa to begin to get, get things going. Um, <clears throat> In the 21st century, a lot of folks are thinking about this in a new way. And if we share the same economic interests, it's war and conflict that we can't afford. We can't afford that anymore. And we have to begin thinking about how we move in that direction. And I believe India and Pakistan can ensure peace by making war on something that the middle class can't stand for. When you can get the middle class in your country to say, we, stop this, we want to have the economics work, then you have moved to a place that I think will, will go a long way toward resolving the problems. Now, recently I, I went to the last of the states I hadn't been in India, which was Orissa, and things are developing rather quickly there. 
And the same is true in Gujarat. There are a number of places where it's happening. And the cross-border things just have to begin to be uh, dealt with. And I, the port of Gwajar in, in Pakistan, uh, has a real opportunity to be an interesting place of a focus for what happens economically. Uh, India and Pakistan are both gateways. And to this whole of the stands and the whole of Central Asia. And <clears throat> I've been a fan of building the pipeline from Gwajar up through Pakistan and Afghanistan up to Turkmenistan and bring, it, bring all that gas down. It's tough how you'll keep it safe enough to have a pipeline. How wide will the, 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 pa the uh, path be <laughs> that you've got to protect? Uh, the pipeline is estimated to cost $7.6 billion, and there are people who are talking about signing an agreement to be done by 2016. Um, all of this is possible if people are talking to one another. And I want to go to one last thing that I, I discovered in, in looking at this, which I hadn't um, known about, and that's this whole business of fishermen. Um, Fishermen go out from the coasts of India and Pakistan, and who knows where the border is, right? So you fall over the border on this side, and you get into trouble, and you go to jail, and you fall over the border on this side. Those kinds of things can, people have been spending months and years in jail. Poor fishermen. Those kinds of things can be resolved by, by talking. And I personally think that the way forward is on an incremental basis of finding things where, in, in the terms of the guys from Harvard, the getting to yes, something that you agree on, something I agree on, if we agree on it, then how do we get to where we want to go? And it's possible to do if people are talking. And that's what's really exciting about seeing all of you here today. And I am going to go run and vote in the House of Representatives. Thank you. <laughs>